And now uh, let me invite Susan Ellenberg from the University of Pennsylvania up to talk about theory and goals of randomization in standard of care interventions. Okay, so this goes forward. So that's your, probably your, your, your counter, this. Okay, forward. Right. Thank you. So uh, the concept of um, randomization in research, um, some, most of us think of as relatively new, but um, as you can see from this slide, a Flemish physician back in the 17th century uh, was thinking about this. Let us take out of the hospitals, out of the camps, or from elsewhere, 200 or 500 poor people that have fevers, pleurisies, etc. Let us divide them in halves. Let us cast lots that one half of them may fall to my share and the other to yours. I will cure them without bloodletting and sensible evacuation, but you do, as you know, we shall see how many funerals both of us shall have. Uh, so like maybe the first uh, large simple trial or pragmatic trial. But the concept of randomization more recently was introduced into agricultural experiments uh, in the 1920s by R.A. Fisher. Uh, who recognized that testing soil treatments and other uh, approaches on systematically selected plots, no matter how hard people tried to make everything the same, left it to the investigator's judgment to balance uh, for all the factors, and that randomization would permit the assumption that there were no differences between treatment groups except for the treatment itself. Uh, and in the 1940s, uh, British statistician Austin Bradford Hill, uh, who had been doing a lot of um, observational studies uh, for the Medical Research Council and was very familiar with the confounding issues, pushed for randomization in clinical trials that the MRC uh, funded. And a quote from Hill uh, is, having used a random allocation, the sternest critic is unlikely to say when we eventually dash into print that quite probably the groups were differentially biased through our predilections or through our stupidity. Um, the effect of randomization is very simple. It allows you to assume that the prognosis is approximately the same on average in each randomized group. For factors that you know are prognostic and are measured, you can check on the balance across groups, but for factors that you don't know about, randomization allows you not to worry. Too often we think we know everything. We know all the important prognostic factors, and we have countless studies uh, showing that we, in fact, do not. If you like pictures better than words, uh, this just shows you. We, we uh, have, a, have an initial study population. Some of them are good prognosis. Some of them are poor prognosis. We may not know exactly which is which. And when we randomize, we can assume that we're going to end up with the same proportion of good prognosis and poor prognosis patients in each treatment group. So that's the beauty of randomization. Uh, and uh, it caught on pretty quickly. Um, but of course, there were, you know, there were some concerns about uh, assigning treatment uh, by a random method, by a coin flip, and there's been a lot of discussion over the years, hasn't really abated, about what is the ethical basis for randomization. So um, in 1974, Freed proposed the concept of equipoise, where you can randomize ethically if the physician really has no preference for either treatment. Um, some people didn't really like that. You know, how is it that you know somebody's always got a preference? There's always a basis. So in 1987, uh, Benjamin Friedman proposed the concept of clinical equipoise, that recognizing that physicians may have preferences, but if you recognize if if he or she recognizes that there are differing views across the clinical community, that there's that there's a clinical equipoise, and that allows me, even though I have a uh, a preference or I have a hunch as to which is better, it allows me ethically to randomize my patient into one or the other treatment. Uh, another uh, ethical basis that's been proposed is the uncertainty principle, where both physician and patient are uncertain as to which treatment might be more beneficial. That allows ethically a randomization. And there's been a huge debate uh, about which of these is really most uh, appropriate, and I'm not going to go into that. Um, random does not equate to haphazard. Alternating treatment assignments is not randomization. Assigning the treatment according to the first letter of the last name is not randomization. Assigning the treatment according to the day of the arrival at clinic is not randomization. Assigning the treatment according to whether the day of birth is odd or even is not randomization. These are all uh, some kind of systematic assignments, uh, and they can all undermine uh, the impact of randomization. Um, 
um, met most of these undermine randomization because uh, there's inadequate concealment of the treatment assignment. If trial personnel know the treatment to be assigned, this may affect who even gets approached to be offered trial participation. Uh, if if uh, you can undermine randomization when you don't bother to follow up randomized participants who stop taking the study medication or are otherwise uh, non-compliant because the prognosis of those stopping treatment may differ from those who remain compliant. And even if you have the same, about the same numbers of dropouts on both arms, this difference may not be the same on the treatment arms. People may drop out on one arm for different reasons than they drop out on the other arm, and you lose that wonderful protection of assurance of equivalent prognosis in the two arms. Um, you can undermine randomization by allowing those who evaluate outcomes to be aware of the treatment assignment. If somebody who's reviewing the scans to look to see whether, in fact, the, the tumor has shrunk or gone away and they know who's on which treatment, um, and uh, an evaluator has a belief uh, as to which treatment is better, this can affect judgment. This is why we go to such lengths to try and blind whatever we can or mask whatever we can. Um, in, in clinical trials. Now, um, to me, randomization and standard of care trials, uh, the, the theories and goals of randomization and standard, care, uh, standard of care trials isn't different from, the randomiza from randomization in any kind of clinical trials. But um, it's worth noting that um, standard of care trials are likely to be heterogeneous in many ways. Uh, and heterogeneity makes a signal more difficult to detect. There's going to be more variability. We are trying to do studies that where the results are maximally generalizable. Um, so in these kinds of studies, I think it's especially critical to avoid even small biases that could hide a small but important effect or produce an apparent but false effect. Uh, I'm going to conclude uh, by um, talking about a couple of proposed modifications to the randomization process. Um, one is the allocation ratio. In most trials, uh, people randomize one to one, 50-50, whether you're going to be in one group in the other. Uh, there's, there's a few exceptions, but um, generally it's one to one. Uh, there has been, over the, um, over the last uh, few decades, advocates for a response adaptive approach to randomization. And what this means is changing the allocation ratio as the trial progresses to favor the treatment that is looking better. Um, so that sounds very good. The goal is to end up with more participants actually receiving the superior treatment. And there have been several different types of designs that have been proposed to accomplish this. Uh, perhaps the first was the play the winner design that the late Marvin Zellin uh, proposed back in the, uh, in the 1960s for use in cancer treatments. Uh, some modifications of play the winner uh, called adaptive uh, bias coin designs and earn designs. Again, I'm not going to go into the details of these, but the goal is that as the trial progresses and as more information is developed, more people are going to get the better treatment. Um, issues that have been raised about uh, COVID, about uh, response adaptive randomization uh, are on this slide. Uh, one worry is that patient characteristics, the characteristics of patients entering the study may change over time. So you may end up with imbalances. So if toward the end of the study one treatment looks better and your 75 percent of the people are getting treatment A and only 25 percent are getting treatment B, but if better prognosis patients are the ones entering later, you're going to have a, 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 a real bias. And again, uh, you may think that you can control for that by looking at the risk factors, but I will tell you that there are prognostic factors that we don't know about, and, uh, and you may be misled. Uh, another point is that imbalanced allocation is less efficient. You'll need a larger trial if you change the, uh, if you change the allocation ratio, and this will offset to some extent, possibly even completely, um, the reduction in the actual number getting the inferior treatment. You will always have a lower proportion getting the inferior treatment, but you may actually have more people getting the inferior treatment, and of course then you will delay transmitting the information to the, uh, to the full patient horizon. Um, a less practical issue that people have struggled with is when, when we do clinical trials with a one-to-one with a -one, uh, allocation, we create uh, what I think of as a sort of a convenient fiction for ourselves. At the beginning, we don't know which one is better. 
and we're going to say we don't know until the end which one is better. Our knowledge is a step function. It's zero at the beginning and it goes up to, to 100 percent uh, at the end and we may have a data monitoring committee to make sure things don't get pretty much out of whack. But that's how we justify doing the study. If, if as part of your design you are formally determining that one treatment is likely superior, what does that do to the ethics of continuing to randomize? Uh, the person who is um, who the, 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 the study design itself has determined that one treatment is likely better, so only one out of five people are getting randomized to what to the inferior arm. How does that feel? So that's an issue that some people have raised. The second, um, the second uh, uh, approach to a modification of randomization has to do with the timing of randomization, and this was the randomized consent, do consent design, or also known as pre-randomization, uh, that was proposed also by, uh, by Marvin Zellin. And the concept of this design is that you determine eligibility of a patient and obtain their random treatment assignment prior to talking to them prior to obtaining consent. And in fact, as this was originally, propo as this was originally proposed, um, this would be a, a comparison between a standard of care uh, and a new approach, and the people who were assigned to standard of care wouldn't even be told about the study, wouldn't be told they were part of the study, wouldn't be asked for their consent, because they were getting what they would have been getting outside the study. Um, it hasn't really been uh, operated like that uh, very much. There have been some that have been operated like that. But most of the time this, this design has been used, uh, both, uh, both uh, arms have been, have been informed. So you, you talk to a patient, you say, we're doing this study, and if you participate in this study, you will get treatment X. Um, the patient, of course, can say, I don't want anything to do with treatment X, I want the other treatment. Um, but in order to maintain the validity of the analysis, you have to analyze according to, this is my last slide, according to uh, the treatment assigned rather than, uh, rather, regardless of whether the patient accepted that treatment. And the motivation for this design was that the belief that patients would be more likely to agree to participate in a trial if you tell them what they're getting, rather than if you say, we're doing this wonderful trial and I'm going to decide by the flip of a coin uh, which treatment you will get. Uh, again, this was developed by, uh, in the context more of cancer trials where, um, where there was a lot of concern that there weren't getting enough people in the trial. Uh, I would just note that cluster randomized trials in which the treatment assignment is going to be known in advance for all in the cluster will have some similarities to the randomized consent design. The issues with the randomized consent design, which were actually also developed in the context of non, uh, a non-mask study, is that there's no allocation concealment, so that this can affect which patients are even approached to participate in the study, uh, with de deciding in advance who you're going to randomize. Uh, a bigger concern, perhaps, is that the knowledge of the assigned treatment may substantially affect the information provided during the consent process. There can be an overfocus on the benefits of the treatment that the patient would actually get, a minimization uh, of the risks. Um, the patient, physicians may not even reveal or may slough over the fact that the treatment assignment was chosen randomly. Um, so that's, a, that's, a, that's an issue that a lot of people have raised uh, with this design. Uh, of course, there can be selection bias. Some individuals will refuse the assigned treatment. That selection bias won't operate if you, if you analyze as randomized, as proposed, uh, but then you may have a substantial dilution of the results. I would note that in practice, this design has usually not led to the hypothesized large increases in accrual that were the main motivation of design, and it's not used very often. The most uh, well-known cases of this design being used were the, uh, lump the original lumpectomy versus mastectomy uh, trial that was done by the National Surgical Adjuvant uh, Breast Project back in the 1980s, uh, and in the uh, very well-known extracorporeal membrane oxygenation trial, the ECMO trial. Uh, both both of those trials. So I will stop there. Um, do we have a few questions? Yes, in the back. Please go to the microphones. Great. Mike Caron, Public Citizen. Susan, do you think it's fair to characterize routine medical care as random in the sense that you're talking about? I think what Hal was talking about was random from the patient's perspective. From the perspective of the clinical community, I don't think it's random. But I, and I don't think Hal was saying that. He was saying from the perspective of the patient, it appears random.
Yeah, my question has to do with selection bias. Uh, Brad Gray from the Urban Institute. Um, if patients know that there are alternatives and have a preference for one or the other, and only consent, and the only people who consent to randomization are people who don't have a preference for one and the other, then um, what happens to randomization under that circumstance? Well, you have uh, you have internal validity, and that is you have an answer, uh, a, a valid answer for people who don't have a preference. Uh, you may, if there's a lot of people who have a strong preference, you have limited gen you may have limited generalizability. That is, this answer, in principle, applies only to people who don't have a preference. Now, if you think that whether or not you have a preference is related to your prognosis or related to how likely you are to respond to either treatment, then uh, you may have a problem in extrapolating, extrapolating this result. But those are judgments. Carl Danjo from University of Rochester. That was a nice talk. Thanks. Uh, I just wanted to put in a plug for the Data Safety Monitoring Board. You mentioned it, but I think that is one way to avoid the difficulty of that step function that you propose for between, between beginning of trial and end of trial. If it, a, an active Data Safety Monitoring Board really can, can avoid some of those problems. That, that's right. And when, when we're doing a clinical trial where there are serious uh, major outcomes, like you're looking at mortality, you really have to have somebody watching. You don't want to get to the end of the trial and find out that there were 100 deaths on arm A and three deaths on arm B. So you have to have some protection against that. Okay, thank you very much.